Yeah, we're going to go into sampling distributions and probability. So uh, kind of um, building off of what you've already learned in chapter five. So let's take a look at um, what sampling distributions are. So at the simplest um, possible way of thinking of sampling distributions is a sampling distribution is uh, a distribution that is created with sample means, an entire um, distribution of means. Whereas a, um, a, a, a normal distribution or a standard distribution, that's a distribution made up of raw scores. A sampling distribution is is a sample or is a distribution completely made up of only means. There are no raw scores. So it's very important to understand that. So basically once we create the distribution of means, we can actually compare our sample to that uh, distribution and look at where our sample mean is compared to the uh, this kind of theoretical distribution. So there's a couple of different things to think about when we're talking about um, probabilities and, and sampling distributions. So there's sampling without replacement and sampling with replacement. So sampling without replacement is what we often see that we're using in research when we're actually dealing with real humans. So we have, you know, 30 participants and we need to split them into two different conditions. Um, we can't use sampling with replacement because a, a person can't be in both conditions at the same time. So basically, let's say I put 30 people in a hat and I'm going to pull and say, okay, the first 15 people I, I select are going to go into the experimental group. Well, if I pull out, um, let's say John, whoever John is, I go, oh, John, you're in the experimental group. Well, I can't put him back in the hat because if I pull him again, he can't go to a different group. He, he can only be in one place at one time. So therefore the probability changes. John, because he was the first one picked, had a one in 30 probability of going to the experimental group. Whereas the next person it has a one in 29 probability. So sampling without replacement is when um, the probabilities change each time. Um, sampling with replacement is where we, we, put, we put John back in there. And that, this is really not for the actual research. This is actually for building that theoretical distribution. So no matter how many samples I pull, there's still a one in 30 chance, no matter what, because I keep putting that person back, putting them back, putting them back over and over. So this builds that um, theoretical distribution for us to compare our sample means to. So here's kind of an idea of that um, sampling with replacement, which is actually called theoretical sampling. So if we're replacing each time, that means that um, the probabilities stay the same. But sometimes we we'll want to know, well, how many samples of a certain sample size do would we ob obtain from this certain population size? So here's an example. So here's how we come up with the total numbers of samples possible, depending upon what we're looking at. So if we have two sample, uh, we have a sample of two participants. Say we want to take a sample of two people and we have a population of only a population size of three. Remember a lowercase n is sample size and uppercase n is population size. I know it's really small numbers, but it's to help you kind of understand what's going on. So basically we use that uh, population size to the sample size uh, exponent and we have three to the second power, which means nine samples. So here's an example of what that would look like. Let's say I have um, letters A, B, and C, and that's my population, okay? These three letters, A, B, and C. And I wanna find out how many samples of two can I get from um, the letters A, B, and C? You know, how many samples of two would I get? Well, let's put all three of those letters in a hat on a piece of paper. So the first one I pull, oh, I pulled A, okay? A, I got the first time. Well, I have to put it back because we're using theoretical sampling, which is that replacement. 
So I pull out again. Guess what? I could get A again. So there's my first sample of two, A and A. Well, the next time I pull A, oh, okay, I have A again, put it back, and I pull, oh, guess what? I could get B. So do you see there's all these possibilities? And then if I chose A as the first choice again, I could get A and C. So there's three random samples if we just selected A as the first. But guess what? We have to think about all the other possibilities. We could choose B first and then A second. So there's another sample of two. We could choose B first and then B again. There's another sample of two. We could choose B first and choose C second. There's another sample of two. But then we have to consider, oh, look at the samples uh, of C was first. We could have C and A, my initials. We could have C and B. Or we could have C and we could pull C again the second time. So here's where the nine uh, samples of two comes from because here's all the potential variations of a sample size of two. So you can see where this would get really complicated to do in this format if we were like say had a population size of 100 and we wanted to select 30 samples. It would get out of control. But even if we had a population of 100, so n equals 100, and we wanted to find out how many possible random samples of 30 we would obtain, oops, 30, it would just be done just like this. It would be 100 to the 30th power, and we would just plug that into our calculator and it would be a very large number. So um, it, it's just the same um, theory behind it. So here's um, another, um, way of looking at it is experimental sampling. So um, theoretical sampling is sampling with replacement. Experimental sampling is sampling without replacement. So each time we're taking away, okay? So think of it um, as um, taking away something every single time. So here we have this interesting equation, right? Just think of whenever you see this exclamation point, and there's a mathematical term for it, but I don't even want to try to confuse you. Just think of it. Anytime you see that exclamation point, you take one from every one of the numbers, okay? Um, it is what you're going to do, or one from the numbers, Does it, if that makes sense. So um, again, if we have a sample size of two, and we have a population of three, and we just plug that in. If you'll notice, um, n is three. So we have three right there. Now is what we need to do is account for all the numbers below it. That's what that exclamation point is doing. Is it's thinking, okay, all the numbers below, you're minusing one and accounting for all the numbers and multiplying. So we have three. The next number below three is two. The next number below two is one. Sorry about that weird thing. Now we don't use zero because it would just cancel everything out. So it's the same here. Now I just do this in exact order. So um, if you'll notice, the lowercase n is the sample size, which is two. Well, think of it as this two times one, right? I just think of that in parentheses. And then we have capital N minus lowercase n. Well, three minus two, right? is one. So that's just multiplying across. So we end up with three samples of two if we're using experimental sampling because we're taking away every single time. We're taking away. So a, a little bit different. So um, kind of think of like, you know, let's say we have um, a, a population of five and we have a sample size of three that we want to take. Is what we're doing is we're setting up like this. So five times four times three times two times one, all in the numerator. I know it's, it gets kind of crazy. And then in the denominator, just think of it this way: three times 
times two times one. I'm gonna just put that in parentheses. And then remember five minus three, right? So five minus three is what? Two, right? And that's how we would find out uh, what our sample size. So I could look at this five times four times three times two times one. That's 120 in the numerator. And we have three times two times one times two. So it's 120 divided by 12. So it would be 10. We would have 10 samples of three using experimental sampling. So hopefully that helps you uh, to kind of grasp uh, the difference between experimental and theoretical. So now we can think about sampling distribution. So I'm gonna move this down just a little bit. So uh, the sample mean is basically an estimate of the population mean, and that's how a sampling distribution is con like constructed. So in previous chapters, our distributions were of scores, specifically raw scores, either population scores or sample scores. But with a distribution of sample means, which is a sampling distribution, it's a distribution of all the possible samples of a specific size from a population and taking the means of all those possible samples. So we'll take a look at what that looks like. So here we have um, kind of what I was doing with the ABC um, example, but now we're using numbers so that you can see how the means work. So let's take, we're, say we're taking a sample of two, okay, from a population of raw scores. And there's only four raw scores, two, four, six, eight. So is what I always do is I kind of focus on what our first choice would be. Let's say we put all four of those in a hat and our first cho choice was two. And here we have our first sample of two, two and two. Second sample of two, two and four. Third sample of two, two and six. Then we have two and eight, if that makes sense. And we do that across the board for each of these. Now the first choice is four. So think about if we have a population of raw scores, that's N equals four, right? And we're taking a sample of two to get all the possible, it's four to the second power, which is 16, right? If you look, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There are 16 samples of two. So that's how it's working. Now, once we get those samples, we can basically ignore the raw scores after we take the means. So is what we do is we take the means for each of those samples of a specific size. So we, you know, like for example here, eight plus eight is 16 divided by two, because that's how many are in that sample is eight. So we, we take the means for all of those possible samples. And is what we can do is we can make our sampling distribution. So once we um, create uh, all the possible random samples and we get all their means, that's what we make the distribution out of. We don't make it out of raw scores. These are all means. So here's kind of what that looks like. If you use um, this, these were all the means we calculated. And guess what? We, we, um, if we were to add up all of the means and divide by how many random samples of, that, uh, of those means, so uh, we would add up all those 16 means and divide by 16, our sampling means would be five. So uh, M equals five, because that's a sample mean. Well, if we added up two, four, six, eight, and divided by four, our population mean is five. So if you'll notice our sampling means, it, it basically um, peaks at where the population mean is. So it, it reflects the population. It's just now a um, distribution where we can actually use it to compare things to. So our means will be the same. The sampling mean will be the same as the, um, actual population mean. So here's some things that um, are important for you to understand. So 
according to the central limit theorem, and this is an important concept in research, as our sample size increases, the distribution becomes more normal. So if you'll notice, here's what we had before. If we just had two, a, a score of two, a score of five, and a score of eight, that's not a normal distribution. It's a flat, same, it's like the same mode across. It's not a normal distribution. So guess what? We can't find probabilities for that because it's not a normal distribution. But if we have more, um, a, a larger sample, so now we've created the sampling means from that, that can build us up into a normal distribution. So what it does is it creates all the possible random samples so that we have a normal distribution so we can start utilizing probabilities because we can't find probability unless we have a normal distribution. So it really does help us. And this is, in, um, it is a very useful concept in general. Um, and this is one of the reasons why in research um, there's what we call a magic number. So we all, almost always want a sample size of 30 or greater because we notice even in just in general, um, not with a sample means distribution, but with even raw scores, that with 30 or more scores, we see the distribution starting to become normal. And so that's kind of this magic number where normal distribution starts occurring naturally. So that's one of the reasons why we always uh, try to um, obtain at, that normal distribution. And, and we try to obtain 30 participants usually. So now that we're dealing with means rather than raw scores, we have to, atta we have to account for the fact that our sample means is just an estimate of what we would see in the population. So in reality, um, our, our sample is always going to differ than our population. Uh, it's always going to differ. So what we have to do is we have to measure the distance that our sample mean deviates from the population mean. Now, I know I said, uh, you know, um, it, um, it, the mean will be the same, but there is error. There's going to be bias just based on how the numbers fall. So is what we have to do is take into account of um, that difference, that deviation. It doesn't mean there's a mistake or anything. It just means there's a natural discrepancy between the sample and the population. So is what we have to do is account for, okay, what is our sample size and say, okay, this is how much error we would get between our sample size that we have and the um, original population. So we have to take into account the standard error of the mean, and that's the notation that I always use, SEM. And this is where you um, uh, want to be um, really careful because now we're using population information and sample information. So if you'll notice, this is population standard deviation, and this is sample size. Now, again, this is the same thing as this because the square root of variance, which is this squared, um, the uh, drawing a blank, sorry, uh, sigma, lowercase sigma squared, um, the square root of that is the, is the standard deviation. So I typically always go through to standard deviation. So whenever we're doing the standard error of the mean, it is the population standard deviation divided by sample size. So we want to be really careful that we know our notations at this point. So this is what we're going to be accounting for things. Instead of just using the standard deviation, we're going to have to use the error, that standard error, that distance. So here's kind of um, some things to think about as far as error. So as variance or standard deviation increases, okay, as the population um, increase, as the population standard deviation increases or the variance increases, the error increases. But as it decreases, the error decreases. So think about it this way. Um, if we're looking at SEM, the standard error of the mean, 
and we have the population standard deviation over the square root of, let's just say five, okay? No matter, it, if this number goes up, if this number goes up, that means this number goes up, right? Because five, the square root of five divided into that. But if that number goes down, this number goes down. So you can see how, how that works. So here we have um, a population standard deviation of let's say approximately nine. Notice our error is 6.38. But as population standard deviation is 20, now our error is probably more like 12, right? Or 15. So um, it as uh, population standard deviation goes up, the error goes up because that's a variance. That means that then the scores are kind of peppered everywhere and there's not like real consistent patterns maybe. Um, another um, thing to think about is sample size. So as sample size increases, the error decreases and think about why. Here we have that standard error of the mean again Let's say our population standard deviation is five, okay? And our sample size. Now, if our sample size goes from 25, okay, to let's say 100, that's gonna bring our error down, if you'll notice. So look at here, um, a sample size of five, You'll notice like here we have um, our, our standard error of the mean uh, is at like two, right? But as our sample size goes up, here's a uh, sample size of 25. Now the error is only 0 0.80. So sample size, think about just mathematically what happens in that. So sometimes when you get these kinds of um, questions asked, just think about the equation and where things are placed. So with sampling distributions, we're, just to refresh you, the key here is a sampling distribution is made up of means. So previously, you know, we had, let's say our mean here, but we had X, X's, you know, raw scores throughout here. So that was our standard distribution. Okay, these were all, made up of, of raw scores, okay? Well, now our sampling distribution, just kind of sloppily writing, sorry about that. Now this, it's the same, but right down the middle is M, right? And these are all means. Everything in here is means. They're no longer raw scores. So these are all sample means. So you're, now you have a whole distribution just of means. Okay, so um, we're gonna use, I'm sorry, the standard error of the mean to start um, looking at probabilities. So if you recall in our previous um, chapter, we were looking for Z scores to get probabilities, right? So when we have, um, raw scores, so let's go back. When we have raw scores, let me go here, to find our Z's, it's X minus, right, mu over standard deviation, right? Well, now in our, to find our Z scores, it's Z equals, we're replacing the X with M for the mean, minus mu, because we have that population mean, over the error, the standard error of the mean. So now we're replacing that uh, denominator, we're replacing the standard deviation with the standard error of the mean. So that's why I've kind of come back and refreshed this, um, that standard error of the mean, so that you can kind of conceptualize how we're going to get z-scores so that we can get probabilities. So here's the type of question you might see. So just related to, you know, to what we've learned now. So how large of a sample is necessary to have a standard error that is less than five 
using a normally distributed population with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 20. So first of all, is what I do is I look through this and go, oh, what are we looking for? Sample, how large of a sample? So N equals, that's really what we're looking for. Now, standard error, that is less than five. So SEM less than five. Okay, we know the standard error equation is the standard deviation over square root of the sample size. But if you'll notice, we have extra information. Don't get distracted with that. The population or the um, standard deviation is never um, presented without the mean because it's, it's irrelevant without the mean. It, it's meaningless. So we don't need this information in this one. We need this. So if you'll notice, we have 20 divided by the square root of n, because we're solving for n, remember? And I'm just going to put equals 5, OK? So to get rid of this, this is a fraction. This entirety is a fraction. So 20 divided by the square root of n. Do the opposite of division. We're going to multiply both sides by the square root of n. So then we have 20 equals 5 times the square root of n. Then we need to get rid of that 5, right? That's multiplication, so we're going to divide both sides by 5, OK? So we end up with the square root of n equals 4, right? Now, we have to get rid of the square root. So squaring both sides gets rid of that. And n would be larger than 16. Now, the reason why is we want the error to be less than 5. Remember, error goes down as sample size goes up. So right now, the error is 5 with a sample size of 16. We want it to be less than 5. So our n would be larger than 16. So that would be our final answer. n is greater than 16. And it absolutely matters the signs do. So be very careful about that. You're never going to want your sample size to be less than. So just make your alligator eat the n, no matter what. Just think of that. If, I don't know how you learned it, but I learned it as an alligator. Always make your alligator eat your n. Eat away at that n. How's that? It never goes the other way. So it's always going to be n is greater than whatever the sample size is that you've got. Here's another example. We have um, the same information, a mean of 100, a standard deviation of 20. And it asks, what's the amount of error between the population mean and sample mean for n equals 30? So we're looking for oops, this, right? So we need this. And we have it. 20 divided by the square root of 30. Now I just plug that right into my calculator. 30 divided by, and then my calculator does that second in the square root. I plug in 30 to equal, it is 5.48. Because I got 5.47722 I round to the second decimal, not the third decimal, not the fourth decimal, not the first decimal, the second decimal. So it's 5.48 is the standard error of the mean. Okay, and the next is we're asking again, what's the amount of error between the population and sample for n equals 50? It is the same thing. So SEM equals, and I don't know why my pen keeps doing weird things, 20 divided by the square root of 50. Okay, again, 20 divided by square root of 50 equals, I'm putting 2.83 because it's 2.828, et cetera, et cetera. Round that to three. You'll notice as sample size increases, error decreases. If you look at here, our sample size was 30 our error was 5.48. Sample size is 50, it's 2.83. That makes sense. 
So now here's where we're going to use this information. So that error related to entire samples. So we don't ever look necessarily at raw scores and we definitely don't look at just individual scores usually. It, instead, we look at an entire sample, a whole sample. So that's where we start looking at how does this sample compare to the population or what is expected? So what we do is we look, compare the means of one distribution to another. So here's kind of what we start using. And this is what I introduced to you a, a few minutes ago. We're gonna use that um, transformation equation um, for a sampling distribution. So this is basically the same equation as you had before, but now you're replacing the sample mean, you're replacing the raw score with the sample mean, and you're replacing the population standard deviation with the standard error of the mean. So this is that tree Z transformation to find out where the Z score is for a specific mean. So we're no longer looking for raw scores. So that's the key. When you get these probability questions, um, if you hear, okay, what is the probability of obtaining a mean of such and such? Okay, that's where you're going to want to use this, uh, this um, Z transformation for a sampling distribution. Whereas if I say, oh, what is the probability of receiving a score of something? Now that's where you're going to use your raw score Z transformation equation. So there's a little bit of a difference. You want to listen for those words or pay close attention for the wording. So same as before, um, to be able to find uh, probabilities or proportion, you're going to need that unit normal table again, but you're going to need to transform your mean, your sample mean into a Z score. So specifically the sample mean gets transferred to a Z score. And then you're going to find that proportion that you're looking at specifically in the unit normal table. Again, at the back of your textbook is that unit normal table for Z scores. So, and again, you have to be really clear about where in the distribution you're looking. So you want to be real careful and I would always draw and shade before you do the math to be certain. So here's an example. Okay. We have a researcher that selects a sample of 36 participants. Immediately is what I do is write down my information, N equals 36. From a population with a mean equal to 101, that's a population mean, so mu equals 101, and a standard deviation equal to nine, that's population as well. Standard deviation equals nine. Now it says, what is the probability of selecting a sample mean Here's where that mean comes in. M is 104 or greater, right, from the population. So what we need to do is use this equation. Z equals M minus mu over the standard error of the mean. And we basically set that up just as simple as this. 104 minus 101 divided by our standard deviation divided by the square root of 36, right? So when we do that, I always put parentheses around the numerator and then parentheses around the denominator just to make sure that I'm not dividing the wrong things. Nine divided by the square root of 36. And again, I would not do math in your head just because it's really easy to switch things up. So we have a positive two. That's our z-score, 2.00. You know, this is the key though, is what do I look up? Where, where do I look that up? Is what we should have done is drawn that distribution. So here I have this distribution. My population mean is 101 mu equals, and we know 104 is greater. So here is M equals 104. So we're looking for anything above that, right? So that right there is the tail. 
So I'm going to look up two specifically in the tail. And I'm getting 0 0.0228. So my answer is P equals 0 0.0228. This is the final answer, and it needs to be recorded with P. And you can keep four decimals with probability just because probability can get so small that you need those four decimals. Okay, let's look at the next example. So in the general population, parents spend an average of $112 with a standard deviation of 22.3. Okay, remember that's the order of, of it being presented. And that's during the holiday season for children. So they select a sample of 26. So there's our N equals 26. Um, and they're asking, what is the probability of selecting a sample mean of less than $100? Okay, this is important. We want to make sure that we're looking at this right. Oops, sorry about that. So our population mean is 112. Now we're looking at a mean of less than 100. Well, 100 should be over here somewhere. 100. So we're looking at everything below here. So again, we're going to look in the tail. And we know our z-score should be negative because our sample mean is below the population mean. So we're going to calculate this out. Remember, it is m minus mu over the standard error of the mean, which in this case is 112. Oops, sorry. We're going to do I'm scratch that out. I don't know how to erase on this. 100, sorry, 100 minus 1. 12 sample mean minus population mean divided by 22.3 divided by the square root of 26. Okay, so plugging that in 100 minus 112, and I put parentheses again over around the numerator and then around the denominator 22.3 divided by the square root of 26 equals negative, negative 2.74 is what I'm going to say, okay? And we are looking in a tell. So 2.74 in that Z column, okay? And I'm finding it on page 528 in the second Z column, 2.74 beyond z in the tail is 0 0.0031. So p equals 0 0.0031. So again, that's one of the reasons why I keep four decimals. If, I, if you rounded to two decimals in this, it'd be p equals 0 0.00. So that's really not an accurate description when we're talking about probabilities. So hopefully that helped. Uh, that's the end of our um, chapter um, uh, lecture video. Um, please do the application activities because in this case, practice, practice, practice is necessary for you to succeed. And uh, don't hesitate to ask me questions and let me know if uh, there was anything that was unclear.